Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is honor and pleasure to welcome you to another discussion club uh, organized and hosted by Arsenia Tsenyuk Foundation Open Ukraine. You are very welcome to our to every meeting we have. And uh, since it's a discussion club, you are supposed to actively participate, so please pose your questions. But my very kind ask to you, uh, triple B, be bold, be brave, but be very brief. Uh, as soon as uh, our special guest uh, is going to deliver his speech, uh, we have uh, microphones around uh, this audience. And uh, please raise, raise your hand. And uh, I'm going to invite some of you to pose your questions to our guests. And uh, this is a very, a very unique guest, I believe, uh, since uh, we are, in some cases, in most cases, throughout our life, we are in conflicts. And uh, genetically, we are programmed to somehow psychologically biased uh, fight or flight. But it's a general wisdom to stay smart and wise. And to enrich your personal wisdom, I uh, very recommend you to read the book, some books. And uh, tonight, uh, I would like to recommend you a very special book uh, authored by our special guest, Mr. Jonathan Powell. This book talking to terrorists, how to end armed conflicts, was recently published. And uh, I, I personally admire uh, co some comments made by the critics, uh, like essential reading for all parties in conflict, my, uh, in independent, uh, unusual and unique book uh, by The Guardian, and uh, this one is especially interesting is it's a witty light foot and anecdote rich history of the recent art of talking to terrorists so ladies and gentlemen uh, please welcome our very special guest mr jonathan powell who spent 15 years in foreign office before being uh, asked to lead uh, and to be uh, chief of staff for Tony Blair. An interesting fact uh, not many know uh, about is that it's a dynasty because his grandfather was working uh, uh, for Churchill. Uh, his brother was working for Thatcher. Uh, Mr. Powell was working for Tony Blair and his nephew is working for Mr. Gordon. <laughs> For David Cameron, pardon me. So it's a, it's a dynasty, uh, and it's uh, uh, a lot of insights, a lot of stories. Some of them we are eager to hear here. So again, please welcome Mr. Jonathan Powell. Well, thank you very much, Igor, and thank you all for coming this evening. Um, as Igor said, I spent my life without any training negotiating, first as a diplomat on the Hong Kong, back to the Chinese in the early 80s, on the CSC with the old Soviet Union, on the 2 plus 4 negotiations on German unification, and then for the last uh, 19 years negotiating with terrorists, first for 10 years with the IRA as the chief British negotiator, then with ETA, and I now have a small charity, Intermediate, that works on conflicts around the world in eight different countries, working between terrorist groups and, and governments. I have to say, the first time I met two terrorists, two people who I knew to be terrorists, uh, I didn't feel very warm and cuddly about them. And they were Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness, leaders of the IRA, who I met in 1997. We met them in a room with no windows, so there could be no pictures of the meeting, and I refused to shake their hands. They had, uh, the IRA had shot my father through the ear in an ambush in 1940. Uh, they had put my brother, who worked for Mrs. Thatcher, on a death list for eight years. And I'd just spent a year at the British Embassy in Washington uh, trying to um, stop uh, Jerry Adams getting a visa to go to the United States. So I didn't feel warm and cuddly about uh, terrorists. Three days after that meeting, I got a call from Jerry Adams. Uh, and he asked me to come to Derry. Uh, he told me to come incognito, not to tell 
uh, the police, not to tell the army, just to turn up. So I took a plane to Belfast and then a taxi to Derry. Uh, I stood on a street corner feeling like a minor character from a spy novel. And two guys turned up with shaved heads. And they said, Martin sent us, Martin McGuinness sent us. And they pushed me into the back of a taxi. They drove me around for an hour till I was completely lost. And then they pushed me out of the door of the taxi. And I got out outside a little modern house in a suburb of Derry and I knocked on the door. And Martin McGuinness answered the door uh, on crutches. And he made a very unfunny joke about kneecapping, which was the IRA way of punishing people. They used to drill holes through their knees, through their ankles, and through their um, elbows to punish them. We spent three hours in that room talking. We made no breakthroughs. But it became clear to me that if you're going to negotiate with terrorists, if you're going to try and build trust with them, you have to be able to go on to their territory. You have to be able to talk to them. You have to be able to win their trust bit by bit uh, if you're going to get to a successful uh, conclusion and to get to peace. Now there's a limit to how much uh, trust you can build up with such groups. Uh, we had pretty difficult relations for the 10 years of negotiating when I was going backwards and forwards across the Irish Sea. And I remember one occasion in 2004 when we were negotiating late in a monastery in West Belfast and the monks of the monastery had very kindly given us dinner in the refectory and we were having dinner and I was very worried I was going to miss my plane. And I had this watch on, and the minute hand had become loose and was swinging around, so I couldn't tell what the time was. Uh, Martin McGuinness noticed, and he said, I've got a watchmaker at the end of my street. Give me your watch, and I'll get it fixed for you. And I said, no, no, please, please don't take my watch away. Be, no need. He insisted, and he took my watch away, and so I had a terrorist fixing my watch. He brought it back two weeks later to our negotiations in Leeds Castle, and I, of course, had to give it to the security authorities to have it checked for trackers or for bugs. And they took my watch to pieces and they broke the minute hand again. So I had to have it fixed at great expense. So there's a limit to how much trust you can have with terrorists, however much you're prepared to cross the Irish Sea. Now, having done the Irish negotiations, I wanted to see uh, what lessons I could learn from other negotiations. So for this book, I went back to look at the last conflicts over the last 20 or 30 years and to see how those conflicts ended, what were the common factors. Clearly there's no Northern Ireland model or any other model, all conflicts are different, but what are those lessons that you can really uh, draw from all of those negotiations that can help you? And I want to talk about that in the context of the Ukraine. One of the interesting things that's changing in terms of, of conflicts is that in the old days, they used to, generally speaking, be interstate conflicts, wars between countries. Increasingly, over the last two decades, or even three decades, there have been intra-state conflicts, that civil wars inside countries or terrorist movements inside countries. What's really interesting over the last five to ten years is that those have become both interstate and intrastate. If you think of your conflict here in Ukraine, it's clearly an interstate conflict with Russia, who has invaded part of your country and seized it. There's also been uh, active and supporting and even uh, doing things in the Donbass. Uh, but it's also an intrastate conflict in terms of groups inside the Donbass that have risen up. So you've got this combination of two different sort of conflicts in one. A bit like in Syria. If you think about Syria, it's a conflict between rebels who rose up against Assad. But it's also a conflict with Iran fighting on the ground, with Hezbollah fighting on the ground, uh, even possibly with uh, Turkey fighting on the ground now. So it is both interstate and intrastate, which makes it very complicated to resolve, because who are you negotiating with? The other thing that's changed over the last uh, decade or so is the people who do the facilitating in these talks, the way that you actually bring them to a conclusion. In the uh, late 1980s, as the Cold War ended, negotiations were increasingly carried out by the United Nations. During the Cold War, the United Nations had not been able to play the role of uh, mediator because uh, Russia or America would block it in, in each case. Uh, after, towards the end, so 19, late 1980s in El Salvador, the UN came into its own as a mediator. It did the same in, um, in Mozambique, uh, did the same elsewhere in the world like Namibia. But the UN became increasingly threatening to countries as a, as a mediator in those circumstances, and they started opting for small countries who were less worrying. So in Sri Lanka, 
the negotiations between the Tamil Tigers uh, and the uh, government were conducted by the Norwegians because Norway was a very long way away and not very threatening. In recent years, even governments of very small countries have also become too threatening. And increasingly, you see mediating as far as it's done, done by NGOs, done by individuals, people like Mati Atasari, the former Finland, Finnish president, who negotiated in Aceh in Indonesia uh, and again in Kosovo, or groups like um, the Catholic lay order uh, that negotiated in Mozambique. You have small informal groups negotiating because they can operate underneath the radar screen, operate in a way that other people don't see. Now, obviously, the situation here in Ukraine is particularly serious and particularly serious at the moment. With your domestic political impasse, it makes it very, very hard to have a united front in negotiation when you're busy having a political battle with each other. Uh, it's very difficult to maintain support for sanctions inside Europe uh, as their minds shift to other issues and they see that you're preoccupied uh, with other things. Uh, in terms of Minsk, it is very difficult when people think that you are uh, not implementing everything uh, in the Minsk agreement, when the Russians are winning the propaganda battle of persuading people uh, that you are in the wrong rather than them. And it also is worth thinking about the fact that we're about to enter into an interregnum in the United States. The presidential elections are upon us. Uh, what the US government can do will be highly constrained from about April of this year until the end of the year. So there'll be a gap in American leadership during that period. And you'll find also that Europe is preoccupied by its own problems and less able to focus on what's happening here in the Ukraine. It's not all necessarily gloom, of course. I think that it's clear that sanctions are beginning to bite on the Russians. The combination of sanctions and low oil prices are having an impact. Uh, it's not comfortable for them to stay where they are. And the fact that they've tried to change the subject by involving themselves in the war in Syria is also an indication that they are looking for a way of at least uh, avoiding the issue of Ukraine, if not of actually solving it. So against that background in Ukraine, what are the sort of 10 lessons I would draw out from other negotiations to end conflicts around the world? I think the first would be the importance of being strategic rather than tactical. If you think about President Putin, who I used to have to deal with in government for, for 10 years, uh, he's basically a judo player. He's someone who thinks tactically. He's looking for the counterpunch. He's looking to destabilize the other side. As long as you find yourself reacting to someone in those circumstances, as long as you're purely tactical, that person will win. If, however, you choose to be strategic, uh, you then have the chance of winning yourself. If you can set out a clear strategy, a plan, and stick to it, you will beat someone who is purely uh, tactical. That means focusing on what your main objective is, as I understand it here in Ukraine, your main objective is reform. It's to become a European country. It is to fight corruption. It is to have economic reform. It is to opt for the European direction. And you need to stay focused on that objective because that will help you in your strategy of negotiations. It is crucial that you stay above all focused on that. The second thing you can do is you can frame the negotiations. That means to set the negotiations in the terms that you want rather than simply, again, reacting to what someone else wants. Uh, I worked on the 2 plus 4 negotiations on German unification at the uh, end of the 1980s. And Chancellor Kohl, very cleverly, got out in front of the rest of the uh, group by setting out in a speech his 10 points on the basis of which German unification would happen. By putting those 10 points out, he set a frame for the negotiation. The Russians, the Soviets, kept trying to pull it back. Shevardnadze did a speech with seven points, but it was too late. It was two months after Cole's speech, and Cole's speech had set the framework for those negotiations, and it really worked. Earlier in my life, I was negotiating with the Chinese on Hong Kong, and Deng Xiaoping came out and said that the system saying the, the Hong Kong will be one country but two systems. Once he'd set that framework, we kept trying to argue for sovereignty staying with Britain. We kept trying to argue for the governmental system, but we were st stuck. He had set the frame for the negotiation. That is crucial. If you're going to be strategic, you need to frame the negotiations so that you succeed. The second lesson I would draw is the importance of unity. Uh, always uh, in conflicts like this, people try to divide the other side. You know, the British government spent decades trying to divide the IRA into different groups, the provisional IRA, um, the INLA. The Indian government spends a lot of time dividing the Naga rebels in the northeast of India into more and more separate groups. The Russians will try and divide you. You will not succeed in the negotiations unless you can stay 
uh, united. Um, often the negotiations on your own side will be the most difficult. Thinking of the Hong Kong negotiations with Mrs. Thatcher, she was often the most difficult person to negotiate with. The Chinese were relatively easy, but when you had to come back and negotiate with her and persuade her to make a concession, that's when you run into real difficulties. And the chief negotiator at the time, Sir Percy Craddock, uh, used to say the first law of diplomacy is the hardest negotiation is on your own side. And I think that will be true here in Ukraine as well. And the third thought about unity is the importance of what we call in Britain bipartisanship. In Spain, I worked on the negotiations between ETA and the socialist government in Spain. Uh, those negotiations eventually succeeded in the AT declaration in 2011 that ended the armed conflict between ETA and the Spanish government. But the opposition, the PP, the Conservative Party, made life absolute hell for the government. They attacked them every step of the way. They had demonstrations. They accused the government of selling out. They made life very difficult. In Britain, when Tony Blair became leader of the Labour Party, he changed our policy on Northern Ireland for a policy of bipartisanship. That means he supported everything that the Tory government did on Northern Ireland under John Major, whether he thought it was right or wrong, because he thought it was important the nation had one approach to negotiations, not many different approaches. And that really helped. When we came to government, the Tories more or less stuck to that rule, and they supported us during the negotiations. If you can have that sort of bipartisanship, you have a much greater chance of success in dealing with an adversary uh, like the Russians. The third lesson I would draw are the conditions in which a negotiation is likely to succeed. If you look back over negotiations over the last 30 odd years, you'll see there are certain things in place when they succeed, and if those things are not in place, generally speaking, they won't succeed. The first is what the academics call a mutually hurting stalemate. That means that there's a military stalemate that is uncomfortable for both sides. It's very hard for them to stay carrying on fighting. Uh, in Northern Ireland, the way this happened was the British Army at the end of the 1970s, at the beginning of the 1980s, realized that they were not going to wipe out the IRA. They could contain violence forever, but they would not actually destroy the IRA. About the mid-1980s, Gerry Adams and Martin McGuinness, who had joined the Republican movement very young, realized, too, that they were not going to win. They were not going to drive the Brits out. They could not be defeated. They could go on forever, but they were never going to win. At that stage, about 1985, they started reaching out for moderate Catholic politicians like John Hume. Then they reached out to the uh, Irish government and finally to the British government, and that's what started our peace process going. So when you have that mutually hurting stalemate, you have a chance of getting to a, uh, some sort of agreement in the negotiation. The question is, does that exist in Donbass? Clearly there is no military solution for Donbass. Uh, the Russian government is not going to be able to uh, conquer Ukraine. I doubt Ukraine is going to be able to beat the Russian army. So in the end, there will have to be some sort of negotiated settlement to solve the problem. The second key factor in succeeding in negotiations is strong leadership. If you think about South Africa, if you hadn't had a Nelson Mandela, uh, you wouldn't have had an agreement. But if you hadn't had an F.W. de Klerk on the other side, you wouldn't have had an agreement. You have to have strong, clear, and visionary leaders who are prepared to reach a settlement. If you look at the Middle East, one of the reasons there's very little chance at the moment of getting to a settlement is you do not have such strong leadership on either side, either the Palestinian side or the Israeli side. In the case of Northern Ireland, Tony Blair accused me in his autobiography of saying that he, Tony Blair, had a messiah complex, and that was why he was able to solve the problem of Northern Ireland. In fact, it was we had a, a very colorful Northern Ireland secretary called Mo Molum, a very colorful politician uh, with quite earthy language. And it wasn't that I said he had a messiah complex. It was that Mo Molum told me that Tony thought he was effing Jesus, which is not exactly the same thing. But that belief that you can solve a problem, that belief that it is soluble, is absolutely crucial if you're going to get to a lasting agreement. And lastly, under that category, is outside events. People often think when you're stuck in a negotiation, that it's static. It will go on in the same way forever. It isn't actually like that. Negotiations are dynamic. The situation around it changes. You know, Putin has already started involving himself in the Syrian war. Other things are going to change in this equation that will open up the possibilities for negotiation here, just as the end of the Cold War made a series of negotiations possible in Africa and in Latin America. Fourth lesson, and I'm not going to make it to 10, but I'll go as far as I can before I run out of time. The, the fourth lesson 
is that making peace is not about an event. It's not about a signing ceremony. It's not about uh, a piece of paper. It's about a process. That really came home to me when I was uh, just left government in 2007, and the government allowed me to go through all of the files for the 10 years I'd been in government, looking at all the papers on Northern Ireland. What leapt out of the papers at me was that if you have a process, people have some hope you're going to get to a settlement. There's some reason to believe that you'll succeed. If there is no process, there's a vacuum, and that vacuum is filled by violence. So having a process is absolutely crucial. Um, Shimon Peres, the former president of Israel, who is a master of the one-liner, sums this up rather nicely. He says, in the case of the Middle East, we know what the outcome will be in terms of peace. We know what will happen in terms of territory. We know what will happen in terms of refugees. We know what will happen in terms of Jerusalem, but we don't have any process to get there. He said, the good news is there's light at the end of the tunnel, and the bad news is there's no tunnel. And that's what you're trying to do as a negotiator. You're trying to build a tunnel so you can get to it. You need to have a process. So although you may dislike Minsk, at least you have a process in the form of Minsk that allows you to talk. Without that, the violence would be so much worse. The second lesson about process is the importance of persisting, of being patient. I think of it as a sort of bicycle theory. If you have the bicycle up and running, you keep the bicycle moving. If you let the bicycle stop and it falls over, you'll find it incredibly difficult to keep it going. In the case of Northern Ireland, I stuck to that theory the whole way through, even when other people gave up on the process. So in 2004, we had failed to get to an agreement with Ian Paisley. We weren't going to get to a negotiated settlement. Everyone else gave up on uh, talking to the IRA. I determined to keep on doing it. I flew over to meet uh, Adams and McGuinness in a monastery. I landed at the airport and I was met by an official from the government. And he had me driven about a mile. He stopped the car, told me to get out. So the driver couldn't hear what he was saying. And he said the biggest bank robbery in world history had happened the night before. And the dogs on the street knew it was the IRA that did it. I was absolutely furious. Here was I out on a limb negotiating with the IRA and they just cut the limb off behind me. I uh, kicked a rock and stubbed my toe and felt like getting back on the plane and going back to London. But I determined actually the only sensible thing to do was to keep on negotiating. So I went on to the monastery, I met with Adams and McGuinness, and I couldn't even tell them about the fact that I knew there'd been a bank robbery because the police were not announcing it till the afternoon. So it is often worth absorbing personal pain and political pain to keep that bicycle moving along. Just two more things and then I'll, I'll finish because I've talked too long and the discussion will be much more interesting. The, it's important to bear in mind that a negotiation is not a, a debate. It's not a discussion you're trying to win. You're not going to persuade the Russians, negotiators, of your point of view. That is not the objective of a negotiation. It's to get to a, a document, a piece of paper. It is, however, important that you maintain the moral high ground internationally. Uh, you're not winning the debate at the table, but you do need to win the debate with public opinion in Europe, in the United States, and elsewhere. So it's very important that you do not get yourselves into a situation where you are blamed for not implementing Minsk. And the Russians are very clever at their propaganda, they're very clever at getting their message out. And you need to be alert to the fact that they are presenting you as the ones not implementing Minsk because you are not passing constitutional reform. You need to be much clearer about things like the elections. No one could possibly ask Ukraine to have uh, undemocratic elections on their territory. Would the Germans accept undemocratic elections in Bavaria, elections with armed groups roaming around without Bavarian parties being able to participate? It's a very clear dividing line when it comes to democratic elections. If uh, this is to be part of the Ukraine, those elections have to be held on certain clear conditions. So you choose your territory if you're going to fight an argument like that. Um, just one anecdote to, to before I come to a conclusion, and that is that if you reach a, a blockage in a negotiation, as you invariably do, there are various ways out of it. One of the ways out of it is constructive ambiguity, as we call it. That's ambiguity that can help you out of a difficulty. In Northern Ireland, we were in 1997 and 1998 completely stuck on the issue of IRA weapons. What would happen to their weapons? Uh, we could have sat around for years and years, but the IRA were not going to give up their weapons until they were guaranteed a place in government. And on the other side, the unionists would sit around for years and years, but they were not going to agree to sharing power with people who had weapons. There was a zero-sum game between the two sides. Uh, 
In the end, in the Good Friday Agreement, we put language in that was deliberately ambiguous. Both sides thought it meant what they wanted it to mean. That got us to an agreement in 1998, but it soon started to unravel, and that's the danger of constructive ambiguity. People project different things on it. If they don't get what they want, uh, they find themselves um, I increasingly upset. And by 2003, we were losing the Protestant Unionist support for the agreement, and we had to force the issue of, uh, uh, of, of the question of weapons. So Tony Blair made a speech um, in early 2003 demanding the IRA either give up their weapons or give up the political route. They couldn't have both at the same time. And we were nervous about how they would reply. Uh, that uh, two days later, I got a call from Jerry Adams, and he said to me, it was a very good speech. And I said, thank you. And he said, would you write my speech in reply? And I was very taken aback. I was, OK. And so I sat down and tried to think like an IRA terrorist. And I put a towel around my head, and I wrote a speech. Uh, and I sent it to him. And I was even more surprised three days later to turn on my television and see him delivering exactly that speech with words at the end, can I imagine a future without the IRA? Yes, I can. So we were able to get out of the problem of constructive ambiguity by forcing the issue. But you should always beware of constructive ambiguity in those circumstances. Lastly, you do have to have a certain amount of ingenuity to conclude a negotiation. In the case of uh, Northern Ireland, we were negotiating uh, for the last three years without the two sides ever meeting. The unionists and the IRA never met. I had to shuttle backwards and forwards between them. When we finally got to an agreement, they agreed to sit down. They agreed to appear on television. They agreed what they would say. They agreed how long the meeting would take. But what they wouldn't agree on was where they would sit. Uh, Ian Paisley, who was the leader of the unionists, wanted to sit opposite Adams so that they were clearly rivals and enemies. Adams wanted to sit next to Paisley, the leader of the unionists, so they were equals. And they just wouldn't agree at all. In the end, one of my colleagues came up with a brilliant solution of a new shaped table, a table that was diamond shaped, like this at the end, so that Adams and, McGinn Adams and uh, Paisley could sit next to each other and opposite each other at exactly the same time. And that's the kind of ingenuity you need if you're going to settle a conflict, even one like uh, the conflict here in Ukraine. So my conclusion is that all conflicts are capable of solution by negotiation. Just because they haven't been solved yet doesn't mean that it is not possible if you look back over the last 30 years or actually uh, even longer. Very rarely are they settled uh, intrastate conflicts. Very rarely are they settled by military force. Even the Middle East will in the end be settled by a negotiation. And one of the interesting things looking back at them is that nearly always the first negotiation fails and you second negotiation fails. Spain, that was true. El Salvador, it was true. South Africa, it was true. In Northern Ireland, we had four different attempts at negotiation. In 1973, we had the Sunningdale Agreement. That failed. We had the Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985. That failed. We had the Downing Street Declaration in 1993. That failed. But the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 didn't appear from nowhere. It was built on those previous failures. In fact, the Catholic leader at the time, Seamus Mallon, described the agreement in 1998, the Good Friday Agreement, as Sunningdale for slow learners. Because Sunningdale had had the same provisions in it as the Good Friday Agreement in terms of power sharing, but it hadn't worked until 25 years later. So just because you fail one time doesn't mean you're not going to succeed in the end. An interesting thing happens when you come to the end of a negotiation like this. You have uh, people tell you all the way up to the end that it's insoluble, that you'll never solve the problem. You know, Winston Churchill, he didn't believe you could solve the problem of Northern Ireland. Mrs. Thatcher didn't believe you could solve the problem of Northern Ireland. The second we signed the agreement, everyone said that it was inevitable. It was always going to be solved. The economic circumstances meant it was going to be solved. 9-11 meant that terrorism had gone out of fashion. It's very important that you understand that no conflict is insoluble, but no solution is inevitable. You will only get to a solution if you have strong leadership, people prepared to take risks, people who are strategic, and most of all, people who are prepared to learn from the lessons of the past when they approach the negotiations of the present. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot. And uh, again, you are very welcome to pose your questions. Raise your hand. Uh, wait until you are getting a mic. And then uh, please briefly ask, just uh, limit yourself to just one question, please. <laughs> 
So, raise your hands. Mr. Powell, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation, first of all. Yeah, my question is, uh, to be brief, how to succeed in negotiations if one part does not want them to be successful? I mean, Russia is definitely, uh, they participate, but they do not admit themselves as part of the government from one side. And they are not interested in solution because uh, they are interested in uh, to go on. Uh, and another point is that Ukraine is too weak now economically. And it's obvious that EU and Germany and France representing EU are also interested uh, in finishing conflict to repeat business as usual with Russia because they suffer as well of these sanctions. So, the question is how to succeed in negotiations and to stop the conflict when one and the main, actually, part of the conflict is not interested in its solution. Thank you very much. Preferably within one hour or less. <laughs> no, doing one minute or less. So, the, um, uh, I mean, it's a very good question. And what I was trying to explain is when you look back at what negotiations have succeeded, they usually only succeed if you have a mutually hurting stalemate. In other words, both sides need to be uncomfortable. If you think about Cyprus, uh, for example, um, the problem is that the Greek Cypriots for a long time have been very comfortable because they entered the EU. The Turkish Cypriots didn't. So the Greek Cypriots had no incentive to negotiate. Why would they negotiate? Uh, I'm the Prime Minister's Special Envoy in Libya. In Libya, uh, the parties on both sides, when I got there two years ago, I thought, oh good, it's a military stalemate, neither side could win. But what I hadn't figured out was it wasn't a mutually hurting stalemate. Both sides could advance a little bit, could take a bit of territory, make some money. It wasn't a mutually hurting stalemate. So you need to have a mutually hurting stalemate. Uh, for that to happen, uh, there have to be uh, things that change. It can be, as in Northern Ireland, the two sides realize they can't win militarily. Or it can be that the cost of intervening I increases. And I think that people have been a bit um, uh, over-inclined to uh, underestimate the impact of sanctions. I think sanctions combined with low oil prices is a real problem for the Russians. When you see Medvedev giving an interview yesterday saying sanctions are not a problem for us, that means sanctions are a problem for them. Uh, they are getting pressure uh, on them. Now the question is, how do we maintain sanctions? Um, and that is going to be difficult as we go into next year. And a lot will depend on Ukraine itself. It's not, it's very easy to, I mean, you are the victims, but it's very easy to slip into a victim mentality. It's important that you're not fatalistic about this. You can win the argument, but you have to go and make it. You have to show that you are the ones who are doing everything to implement Minsk, and they are the ones who are not implementing Minsk. You know, they're not allowing a real ceasefire. They're not allowing proper observation of forces on the ground. Uh, that's, so it's not something that happens to you. It's something that you can make a difference to, but it requires you to do that. Thank you. And the question from the right. And Mr. Powell. Uh, you spoke on um, uh, deliberate ambiguity of uh, agreements, and I think that we can call uh, the Minsk agreement uh, an uh, ambiguous one, because uh, two sides uh, interpret it very differently. Uh, do you think um, the Minsk process is uh, helpful for Ukraine? Should we stick to, the, to this agreement? Um. Well, it doesn't really matter if it's helpful or not helpful. You'd be very unwise to abandon an agreement and sort of give up on it because you would then be the ones in the wrong. You have to start from where you are. Uh, it is certainly true that Minsk is ambiguous, but that doesn't necessarily have to be entirely to the Russian advantage, not to your advantage. As I said at the beginning, I think one of the key lessons for me is the importance of being strategic rather than tactical. You don't have to take their interpretation of Minsk. They try and impose on you what they think Minsk means. Uh, there's a case for you setting out what you think Minsk means. What does Minsk mean on elections, for example? You could set out exactly what OSC standards means. You could set out exactly what um, accordance with Ukraine law means. So that ambiguity doesn't have to be uh, um, uh, a burden only on you. It could also be an opportunity. Secondly, I think the key problem in Minsk actually is sequencing. I was going to talk about this so I had a bit more time. Uh, in nearly all negotiations, uh, neither side wants to go first because they don't trust the other side to do what they're promised to do. So you have to agree almost like a ballet. You split this into small steps. 
and then you have to take the steps one after another. And it's only when the other, tides, other side's taken a small step that you take your step. The trouble with Minsk is the sequencing has got out of kilter. So people are expected to do great big things on their side before anyone does anything on the other side. And that sequencing is crucially important, the timeline. You know, I'm working in Colombia at the moment, and we're just finishing an agreement which Touchwood will conclude by the summer. And the sequencing is going to be crucially important. When do they give up their weapons? When can they participate in politics? When do they have access to transitional justice? If I was doing the negotiations again or thinking about the negotiations going forward, I would think very carefully about the sequencing of steps and how they fit with each other. Mr. Powell, my question is about um, classification or uh, putting all so-called terrorist groups in one line. Can we do it with all terrorist groups in the world? Because, for example, we have uh, terrorists in Spain, in uh, Ireland, in Colombia, other states, but we also have such a terrorist group uh, like ISIS. And this is a huge threat to peace and security. They have actually, uh, we know what aims they have. And uh, is it possible to reach an agreement with them? Or, uh, for example, I cannot imagine to put them uh, on the table in Vienna and to discuss issues in Syria together with other states. So how to do this? Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a very good question. Uh, I personally believe that what happens is every time we meet a new terrorist group, uh, we decide uh, they're completely different and we haven't learned anything from the past and we're just going to beat them militarily. Uh, in the words of Dick Cheney, we don't negotiate with evil, we defeat it. The trouble is, if you look back at history, actually, we nearly always end up negotiating with those groups that enjoy political support. Now, in that context, I'm not talking about small fractional groups that have no political support. You didn't need to negotiate with Bader Meinhof in Germany, the Symbionese Liberation Army in the uh, United States. Those sort of groups have no support. Groups like the FMN, FMLN in El Salvador, ANC in South Africa, the GAM in Indonesia, those groups, or the IRA in Northern Ireland, those groups had real political support. So when I left government in 2007, I said uh, publicly that on the basis of my experience with the IRA, I thought we should be prepared to talk to all uh, terrorist groups that had uh, genuine political support and that we ought to be thinking about talking to Hamas, we ought to be thinking about talking to the Taliban, we ought to even be thinking about talking to Al-Qaeda. Not surprisingly, my colleagues in government came out and said that I was talking rubbish. It was fine to talk to the IRA, fine to talk to the PLO, but not to these new groups. Since then, uh, the Israeli government has negotiated a ceasefire with Hamas. The American government has negotiated the release of Sergeant Barry Bergdahl with the Taliban and some other things. Uh, and even the leader of uh, the head of our internal security service in Britain, the um, MI5, Eliza Manning and Buller, said we should be talking to Al Qaeda. So people's attitudes changed these groups. So if I turn to ISIS, we've had four waves of terrorism up to now. Firstly, nihilism. Uh, secondly, the nationalist terrorists. Thirdly, the new left terrorists. And now we have the religious terrorists. Is it impossible to negotiate with religious terrorists? Uh, a former Israeli uh, cabinet minister said, when God comes into the equation, there's no compromise. So you can't negotiate with religiously inspired groups. That doesn't seem to be true. We have negotiated with the uh, GAM in Indonesia, which was an Islamist group. We have negotiated in the Philippines with the Moros Islamic Liberation Front that was an Islamist group. So there's no reason why you can't negotiate with an Islamist group. Am I suggesting we should sit down with Mr. al-Baghdadi now? No, that would be ridiculous. Uh, on the other hand, uh, even if he wanted to sit down with us. On the other hand, uh, it looks to me likely that ISIS enjoys uh, real political support. Um, it is impossible to imagine a group with only 2,000 fighters taking a city of Mosul with 1.5 million people unless there was real political support for them uh, in that city. And why was the political support for them? Because we had abandoned Iraq in the hands of a very sectarian Maliki government. And, and President Maliki had, a, a Prime Minister Maliki had a, abused the Sunni population to such an extent that they actually preferred ISIS to have continued rule by a Shiite, minor, Shiite majority in the south. So there were real grievances. And unless we address those grievances in Iraq and similar grievances in Syria where people feel uh, uh, excluded by an Alawite regime of, um, uh, of Assad, unless you address those grievances, you're not going to solve the problem. What I'm suggesting is that if you look back at nearly all these negotiations, what happens first is you open a secret channel to the group. So in Britain, we opened a secret channel to the IRA in 1972. 
The crucial negotiations on that channel happened between 91 and 93. If there hadn't been a secret channel, there wouldn't have been those negotiations. In Colombia, the Santos government opened a secret channel as soon as it came to office in 2011. That led to uh, secret negotiations in Havana and now the public negotiations. What I'm suggesting is it would be sensible to open such a channel to ISIS now so that when you get to a mutually hurting stalemate, when we've driven them out of territory and they're back to being a guerrilla group again, but we can't wipe them out altogether, then you'd be prepared to talk. What would you talk about? You wouldn't talk about a caliphate for the whole world because no one's going to agree to that. But those grievances I discussed uh, is actually the things you might talk about. How, what role is there for Sunnis in Iraq in the future? What role is there for Sunnis in Syria? The IRA demanded throughout its history a united Ireland, and they were demanding it at the barrel of a gun, regardless of the wishes of the people of Northern Ireland. The British government would never have negotiated with that, with them. Talking to terrorists is not the same as agreeing with them. Agreeing would be a terrible mistake. So the same with ISIS. We would not talk with them and agree to a caliphate, but we might address the grievances that Sunni populations think. I may be wrong about this, but I just notice every time we come to a new terrorist group, we say it's completely different, we won't deal with them, and yet we always end up doing so in history. Well, thank you, Mr. Paul. Thank you so much for My question will be um, about the security issue. Uh, a few days ago, the Munich Security Conference uh, has been, have been finished. And um, I'm interested in what, kind, what, what is your feelings, what is your thoughts uh, regarding the results of this conference? And uh, what do you um, suggest uh, how to deal with Russia in the context of the um, new Um, thank you. Uh, in terms of Munich, I mean, it happens every year and there's always a crisis going on and I have to say the results don't usually um, change much in the, in the world. They're, they're sort of a talking shop rather than a, than a, a solution-oriented problem. But I do think Syria is interesting because in Syria they tried to get to a ceasefire. And that is relevant to Ukraine too. They tried to get to a ceasefire, but they got to, tried to get to a ceasefire without talking to any of the groups involved in the fighting. And that's not a very logical way to approach a ceasefire. You can have all the countries in the world agree there should be a ceasefire, but unless the people actually doing the fighting have been involved, you're unlikely to get to a ceasefire. And I actually happened to be with a Syrian fighter in Switzerland at the time uh, that outcome of Munich happened, and he was absolutely scathing about it and said there was no way there was going to be a ceasefire, and, and there wasn't, because uh, they're very unwilling to give up fighting Assad uh, until uh, some settlement involving the departure of Assad is involved. And I think we kid ourselves somehow that we can settle the problem of Syria from outside, that somehow if we agree with the Russians or agree with the Iranians, that's the end of Syria. But we're not the people fighting in Syria. There are actual real people who are risking their lives and dying, and that's what you're going to have to uh, deal with. Uh, in terms of uh, Russia, well, I've spent a good part of my career dealing with the old Soviet Union and then with Putin when he, when Putin came to office uh, uh, or ran for president, Tony Blair was the first leader to go and meet him uh, during the campaign. And uh, we went to meet him in St. Petersburg and we went to see the opera and they, um, it was that opera about 1814 and the French flag was stamped under feet, foot by the Russians and uh, we all cheered because, of course, France is our real enemy historically in Britain. And we thought that Putin was a new sort of leader. After Yeltsin, we thought this was going to be a new beginning for Russia. It might really be a democratic leader. And I have to say that I've been sadly disappointed, as, as the rest of the world, subsequently. And I think the, the way to deal with Russia is much the same way that, you, uh, that we deal, dealt with the old Soviet Union, that you have to be very firm, but you have not to isolate them and give them no way out. You have to have pressure, but offer them a way out. Uh, and as I say, I spent a long time in the CSE, and that... I do think that actually, in the end, it was probably more Willy Brandt than Ronald Reagan who led to the end of the Cold War. It was opening up that frontier between the two Germanies that changed things more than just the nuclear threat. Uh, when we talk about Minsk, we talk too much about Donetsk and Luhansk, but we forget about Crimea. What your ideas? how we can bring it <coughs> our territory back? <laughs> Give me all the easy questions this evening. Um, I, I don't have a magic answer uh, to any of these problems, I know, nor, nor, 
nor do I have an answer to Crimea, but I'll tell you what I worry about, and that's I worry about people forgetting about Crimea. I mean, as you say, people talk only about the Donbass, and no one talks about Crimea. And it's almost as if it's a fait accompli, and of course that's what the Russians want to happen. They want everyone just to forget about it, to stop talking about it, uh, to incorporate it into Russia. And the main challenge for you guys is trying to keep um, the issue alive, rather than letting it be something that's a fact. During the Munich uh, Security Conference, my Minister of uh, Russian Federation uh, as uh, Russia done it before a lot of times, blamed West, Western countries for not appropriate attitude to Russian Federation and he said that the world is now as a brink of the new phase of Cold War. What is your opinion? What, what can you say about this position? Um, I think the position is not entirely unreasonable in that I do think that the uh, West missed an opportunity uh, with the end of the Cold War, that we could have actually uh, been a lot more supportive of Russia immediately after the end of the Cold War and as change happened. We kind of stood back and let things happen. And I think we didn't treat Russia with sufficient respect. I mean, it was Tony Blair who invited Russia into the G8, as it became, rather than the G7. Uh, so we did take some steps to involve Russia and to treat Russia as an equal partner, but I think not nearly enough. And if we'd, done, if we'd had more foresight and done that better at the time, uh, Russia might be a different place now uh, if we had done it. In terms of a new Cold War, I have to say, looking at Syria at the moment, my worry is more about a new hot war. I mean, if Turkey goes across the border and Russia hits Turkey, Turkey's a member of NATO, we could find ourselves in a real mess. And I hope, I'd, really, I'd settle for a Cold War rather than a hot war, I guess would be my conclusion. And the question from the left, please. Uh, yes, I, my name is Anton. I have just uh, observed the public debates in the Ukrainian parliament, which, um, in which we are participating a lot of civil activists from, and former inhabitants of Donetsk and Lugansk region. So my question is, how is it possible to use the public diplomacy factor in the forming of an agenda for this peace building, for the negotiation, and how to optimize this process in order to reach the result of the negotiation. Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, the ability to communicate is, is crucial um, in a negotiation. If you're not communicating, you can't possibly succeed in the negotiation. And you need to think about three uh, parameters for your communication. The first and most important is communicating to your own people. You have to explain what you're doing, why you're doing it, um, how to succeed at it. So I think, uh, I'm not sure that, um, uh, and that's a, pr a professional thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do. And I think it's absolutely crucially important if you're going to maintain support for a negotiation in a democracy. The second parameter of, of uh, communicating is communicating internationally. And that's winning a battle of propaganda with a much bigger country that has its own TV station, that has, is very sophisticated at getting its message out. Uh, Ukraine, which is far less resources at its disposal, far uh, less uh, opportunity to get its message out. And I think uh, the ability to do that is crucially important too. And the third angle of it, which I think is also a problem, is the ability and the, um, uh, the practice of communicating with the people of the Donbass itself. Uh, obviously, it's technically difficult because com channels of communication have been cut off. But I think trying to do so, trying to have a clear message for the people of Donbass that they're not off there behind a wall somewhere, but are part of the Ukraine and the people of Ukraine still care about them and still trying to do things, is, is crucially important. And I think that's a third aspect of communication that people should really think hard about. Mr. Powell, hello. My name is Ivan Tropok. I am currently advisor to presidential administration, but here purely on personal matters. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank for your book, New Machiavelli. For me, it was very lesson learned and informative for Ukraine, I think. But my question, if you mind, I will have two questions, but it's uh, very connected. In, Bra in Strasbourg, uh, on the World Forum for Democracy, we discussed that terrorism is about money. It's not about ideas, religion, or something else. What do you think about it? And the second is connected. From your practice, from your experience, if 
So two conflict counterparts have, if I can may say so, public agenda, public demands like territory or a national based, and they have some hidden agenda, economic, money based, or something. What is your experience? How to uh, solve this conflict? Are there should be two separate negotiation, or it once should be to, uh, gathered together and solved as as a one conflict? Thank you. So can I just ask you to clarify the first one? You said that terrorism was just about money. Right. Um, okay. Um, well, in my experience, actually, terrorism is, is very... Well, terrorism, firstly, terrorism is not a very helpful term. I know I called my book Talking to Terrorists, but that's because I really wanted to call it Talking to Non-State Armed Groups that Use Terrorism in Pursuit of Political Aims. And my publisher said I couldn't get that on the cover, so I had to call it Talking to Terrorists. Um, it's usually terrorism is simply a word used to try and um, disqualify different groups you don't want to talk to. So, for example, in Nepal, the Americans uh, classified the Maoists as terrorists, uh, so they d couldn't talk to them, but the Maoists then won the election, which made it rather awkward because they got the majority of the vote. So terrorism is not a terribly useful phrase. In my experience, people I call terrorists, people I've had to negotiate with, generally do have political demands. If they just had demands of money, you wouldn't really negotiate with them. If you're dealing, for example, in Mexico with a drug gang, or you're dealing with the gangs left in Dublin now who have been killing each other over the last several weeks, and it's about the drug trade, there's, no, there's nothing to negotiate about. It's only groups that have political demands where you can seriously consider a debate. Now, I'm pushing that to the extreme and saying even groups like ISIS have political demands you could talk about. But if it's just money, then I wouldn't regard, I mean, calling that terrorist, it's, it's just simply uh, gangland crime and the negotiation doesn't really come into it. Take, for example, in, in Northern Ireland, where we have dealt with the problem of the IRA that enjoyed political support, and right through to the, uh, the worst bits of the troubles when terrible killing was going on, Sinn Féin, which was the political party of the IRA, was getting 30% of the Catholic vote. So the reason we talked to them was that they had political support as well as the fact that they had guns. Um, in terms of the separate negotiations, I, I'm not quite sure we, we had a specific thing in mind. One, one interesting lesson I've noticed is that if you're negotiating with a group that has uh, weapons but is no political support. Take, take ETA, for example, in Spain. ETA was a military group that uh, was fighting a terrorist campaign. There was a separate political party called Batasuna. The Spanish government, uh, over a series of years, negotiated with ETA about the military aspects, about giving up their weapons, about prisoners, about security reform, but they would not talk to them about politics. They would only talk to the political party about politics. In, um, in Turkey, while they were negotiating with the PKK before the current military campaign, the Turkish government was uh, talking to the political party, the HDP, about political issues and talking to the military group, or at least to Ocalan, uh, the leader in prison, about military aspects. And that division seems to me to make sense. You don't want to find yourself negotiating with a purely military group about political issues. You want to negotiate with them about military issues and the political party about political issues. Yeah, and you have a unique chance to pose probably the last question for this evening. And we have a question from the right, please. Uh, Mr. Powell, I would like to move from uh, conflicts rather to rather domestic issues and UK politics. So the debate on uh, possible uh, exit of Britain's exit from the European Union or Brexit is underway. And I just would like to hear your opinion with this regard and this as the insider uh, I'm just, I'm really wondering uh, what is the stance of uh, British political elite towards this issue and what do you think, what could be the consequences for London in this case? Well, the, the consequences of Brexit, of Britain leaving the EU, would be extremely serious for Britain in terms of our economy, in terms of our politics, in terms of our foreign policy, in terms of our culture. But it would also be extremely serious for the rest of Europe. It would remove a key liberalizing voice inside the EU. And that's why people like Chancellor Merkel are trying so hard to meet David Cameron's requests and try and keep us in the EU. That's what they're really uh, pushing hard to do. Um, there's an interesting thing about Euroscepticism in Britain. It is very wide. It's, it's all over the place, but it's very shallow. So if you, um, uh, if you tip the tray, if, I think of it like a, a tray in which you have the water. If you tip the tray even a little bit, the water moves very rapidly. So, for example, opinion against EU membership has moved in the last uh, 
four weeks by about six points. So it's moved very rapidly against staying in the EU. But I noticed last year when a bunch of leaders came out, like Tony Blair, like uh, Michael Heseltine, came out arguing for staying in Europe, it moved six points the other way. So I think the debate can be won, uh, but it's going to be very, very difficult to win, particularly if immigration becomes the issue again in the first half of this year. And as I say, I work in Libya, and when spring comes, immigration from Libya to Europe will come back again. We'll see more people crossing desperately from Turkey uh, into Greece and coming into the EU. That's an issue for Angela Merkel, but it will also be an issue in our referendum debate because people will think it's about immigration to Britain, although it's got nothing to do with that. So I worry about the debate. It is crucial that we win the debate. I'm a passionate pro-European, and it's crucial we win. I think we probably will win in the end, but it's going to be very hard work. So as I promised the last question for, for tonight, and yes. It's easy. Well, um, the, uh, of course, the terrorists are at the table in terms of the Minsk process because they're sitting in the working groups in, uh, in Minsk, so they're already at the table. Um, well, well, one can pretend. The trouble, the trouble with these things is that one can pretend about. I mean, if you look at Georgia, uh, I was talking to some Georgians just recently about. They've never agreed to speak to the representatives of South Ossetia, or and, in the, and only negotiate with the Russians. The trouble is, in the end, they do need to talk to the South Ossetians too. The Russians may be calling the shots, but the people uh, um, uh, also have views. So. I'm not sure that it's sensible to deny yourself the optionality. Yes, the real negotiations will have to be the Russians, but there's no reason not to, in my view, uh, talk to the, these groups as well, as long as you're clear why you're speaking to them uh, and, um, uh, and what you achieve. But I'm, I'm optimistic, actually. I do think that the, the problem of the Donbass can be solved. I think there's a bigger battle about the European vacation of Ukraine, and winning that battle may be a lot harder and a lot more important. Well, thank you. Thank you a lot for this evening. And yeah. I thank all the attendees who came to this uh, event, and I encourage you to join our Facebook community, Open Ukraine, if you haven't been uh, yet. Hopefully you did. And, uh, of course, uh, please follow all the announcements, and uh, we uh, are going to publish all the materials on our website, openukraine.org. Uh, please visit us uh, often, and uh, you are very welcome to our next events. And as a final accord of uh, this meeting, I kindly ask Mr. Powell to share some, preferably some call to actions or some inspiring wishes to all of us. Well, I'm not sure I'm capable of inspiring vision, but um, what's nice for me is to talk to an audience where pretty much everyone's younger than me, which is nice. And what I do think is the future of this country does depend, I mean, it's platitudinous, but it's also true on, the young, on young people. And what I'd encourage you to do is not to lose hope. I mean, it's very easy to become cynical, to give up. Uh, you think maybe you've seen the movie before, Yushchenko in 2004, and it all goes back. It doesn't need to. I think, actually, attitudes in this country, you know, I used to come here when I was in government, and I think attitudes here have changed. I think it is possible to succeed and for Ukraine to become a European country. Uh, it is possible to really reform this country, to get away from the old ways, and I would just encourage you to keep doing it, not to lose the faith in doing it, and in the end you will succeed.